Well, let's pray. Why don't you grab a hand of your neighbor there? You can also get a date this way. <laughs> Holy Spirit, thank you for just your presence hovering over us right now. Thank you for what you're doing. Let there just be anointing on our ears and eyes tonight. Amen. I, I want to, um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to teach on discerning of spirits. That's what I've planned. But I, 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 before I do that, when we were worshiping, I had this, uh, I had this sense that we were supposed to visit this scripture and I was supposed to call a few people up and pray for them. In uh, 1 Kings 18, there's a great story of Hezekiah, who's uh, one of those kings. You know, if you read the book of Kings, it's like this king was evil, this king was more evil, and this king was more evil than all of them. And then every about every, you know, seventh king, there's like somebody who actually follows the Lord. <laughs> and this, is, this king is the king that followed his, the Lord with his whole heart. And he rebels against the king of Assyria, and it says, out of zeal for the Lord, he rebelled against the king of Assyria. And right before that it says, he tore down all the high places in Israel, and then he rebelled against the king of Assyria, who was a wicked king. You know, we're talking Old Testament here, so you kind of got to get the feel for it. And, uh, and he, he, he becomes really zealous, and he's tearing down the high places. He's going after God. And then he's like, we are no longer going to be under this oppressive king. And so he rebels against them. And then when the king of Assyria finds out, he sends Hezekiah a message and says, we're going to kill you guys. We're going to wipe your cities out. And that Assyrian king starts to go after the, the cities like uh, in Judah. And I think Hezekiah is the king of Judah, by the way. And he starts going after the cities in Judah. And Hezekiah panics. And he sends the king of Assyria a message and says, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And he cuts the doorknobs, the golden doorknobs off the temple and sends him an offering. But the king of Assyria um, doesn't relent. He sends messengers to herald on social media, <laughs> you are dead. And everyone who trusts in Hezekiah is a fool. He sends a met, an, an open heralder who says in, in the public square, all of you are going to die if you trust in Hezekiah. And Hezekiah rips his clothes and he just cries out to God to save him. And Isaiah the prophet hears of the problems that are going on and he sends a word to Hezekiah and says, don't be afraid of this man. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's going to be a voice in his, in his mind. I'm going to put a voice in his mind to go home and on his way home, I'm going to kill him. Definitely a little gladiator-ish. And the bottom line is, is that the Lord rescues Hezekiah. But I feel like, uh, I've never spoke like this before on Hezekiah, but as we were worshiping, and I know we have an online uh, campus too, I felt like there was people in this room who you had such a zeal for the Lord that you metaphorically began to tear down the high places in your family, and the enemy got angry, and you know, the doorknobs of the temple, solid gold, but they represent access like you gave the enemy access trying to reduce the anxiety and I feel like the Lord wants to tell you that he brought the enemy in, back into your life not to, so you can be destroyed but so that the Lord can destroy that enemy in your life and I, I feel like like I'm supposed to prophesy to you that that enemy that you tried to make a new covenant with so that you could have peace, the Lord said, he's not, gonna, he's not gonna take your peace offering. 
And the Lord says, I'm going to destroy that enemy. And I'm going to renew your covenant with me. And um, it's, uh, it feels a little bit like Peter, when Peter's like, all in, Lord, the Lord's like, some of you are going to deny me. Peter's like, it won't be me. Maybe these guys, but it won't be me. And the Lord's like, yeah, Peter, it's going to be you. And when Peter sees that Jesus is going to die on a cross instead of rule from Jerusalem, it scares the heck out of him. And this great, this great apostle who tried to defend Jesus with a sword suddenly turns into wimpy Pee Wee Herman and denies Christ three times to the place where when Mary encounters the angel at the tomb, the angel says to her, tell the disciples and Peter that I rose from the dead. And I I just have a sense that the Lord wants to take betrayers and restore them to the rightful place. Peter becomes the head of the church in the first century. You know, Judas denies Christ and hangs himself. Peter denies Christ and becomes the head of the church. It's important to fail successfully. And uh, if that's speaking to you, if you would just stand, I'm supposed to pray for you. And if you're on line, you're on our online church, just put in the chat that Chris is speaking to me because I want us to pray for you because I feel like you have a title over your own head, betrayer. The Lord wants to take that title off of you. He wants to redeem you. By the way, Hezekiah was, became a great, great king. As Peter was became the head of the church. There was no smell in his life that he tried to make a deal with the Assyrian king after those days that the Lord defeated the Assyrian king. His heart was holy after the Lord, the Bible says. And I want to just first of all prophesy to you that you are not a betrayer. That the Lord says to me that your heart is holy after him. And the Lord has erased your betrayal as he erased Peter's, and he said to Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked Peter, do you love me? And you know, Peter denied Christ three times, and three times Peter gets the opportunity to redeem his betrayal. And so I just want to say, the Lord blesses you. The Lord removes the betrayer t- betrayal title off of you. And the Lord's going to bless you like he blessed Peter, like he blessed Hezekiah. And the enemies that are after you, the Lord is going to destroy those, obviously not people. The Lord is going to destroy those enemies. He's going to give your confidence back. He's going to, he's going to cause everything you touch to turn to gold. And your story is going to be, I stood up as a betrayer, and God opened the door for me to actually, to actually be his friend and to preach the gospel. So I bless you in Jesus' name. Just say this. We bless you, we bless you. in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit down. That's a good word right there. Let's just give it up for him, why don't we? It is warm up here. Um, I want to talk about, yeah, I know, I have my shirt on. Kathy bought this for me. What's it say? I fix things and I know things. She bought this for me. I guess it's true, partly. Um, First, I want to talk about the gift of discerning or distinguishing of spirits, discerning or distinguishing of spirits, depending on what what translation of the Bible that you read, discerning of spirits or distinguishing of spirits. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10 says, to another, the gift of distinguishing of spirits. And I I, want to just say that I think that the gift of distinguishing of spirits is the most important gift that the body of Christ needs today. Now, let me point out that Paul actually wrote in the scripture, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you would prophesy. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not uh, disagreeing with that verse. I'm saying we do pretty good with prophecy here, and I'm saying the lack that, we, that I think the, the body of Christ has, at least in the charismatic church, is a lack 
of discerning of spirits. And I wanna point out that we don't inhabit this planet, we cohabit this planet. We don't inhabit the planet, we cohabit this planet, and we share this planet with angels and demons. We share this planet with angels and demons who are in, a, a, in another realm, but even though they're in another realm, how many know you live in two realms? <laughs> and so I think that this gift of discerning of spirits gives us the ability to discern the unseen beings that are, we are cohabiting the planet with, which is a vital function of developing spiritual intelligence in our life. What I'm getting at is that the gift of discerning of spirits helps us to discern what spirit is motivating or at the root of different issues in our lives, in the lives of our city, in the lives of our children, in the lives of our country. And I, I, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is, you know this verse, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. But I've, I've been saying this for about a year. For me, the most profound gift I mean, the most profound verse for me is actually the previous verse right now. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. But the previous verse, the 16th verse says this, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him this way no longer. And what I'm getting at is that Paul, before he says, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. He points out that we're no longer going to know each other after the flesh, but after the spirit. And I believe that the Lord wants to put a discerning of spirits on us for one of the reasons so that we will actually know each other future present instead of past present. That we actually know each other after the spirit and not after the flesh. And not just that we know each other that way, but that we actually relate to each other after the spirit. And let me just broaden it. Not only should we know other people after the Spirit, but we ought to know ourselves after the Spirit. We ought to be able to understand ourselves after the Spirit. And I believe that, you know, David is a great example, King David, that when the prophet came to, to David's house, when Samuel came to Jesse's house, the father of David, and, and said, hey, I'm supposed to, I'm here to commission a king. And Jesse lined all his seven sons up for the king, for the prophet to see who was going to be king. And Samuel immediately starts to anoint Elib, the oldest. It says that Elib was head and shoulders taller than anyone in Israel. He looked kingly. And he started to pour the oil over Elib. And the Lord said to him, Samuel, stop. Do not look as man looks, but look as God looks. And so he went down the line to all the sons, the seven sons, and there was no one to anoint. You can imagine that Samuel's maybe thinking, gosh, do I have the wrong address? Do I have the wrong house? I was really sure this was it. And he turns to Jesse and he says, are these all your sons? He said, no, I have one more son. He's with the sheep. And he says, well, call him in. And he calls David in. And as David's coming in, he says this. It's, it's, the Bible describes David as ruddy and redheaded. Just a few minutes earlier, it describes Elip as head and shoulders taller than all of Israel. In other words, the guy who's supposed to be anointed don't look like a king. And the Lord goes, that's the guy that's the king. Anoint him king. And David points out in the Psalms, he says, in sin, I was conceived. Likely David was conceived out of wedlock, probably why Jesse didn't invite him to the inauguration. And what I'm getting at is that the Lord often uses the disqualified. He often uses people who don't look kingly. He often, looks, he often uses people who no one else thinks ought to be in a position. And what I'm getting at is this is the depth of the discerning that we need. We don't need discernment just to cast out demons. We need discernment to actually know each other after the Spirit. Yeah. Listen, not just, not just us, our children. Yeah. Like, do you know who's growing up in your home? 
Sometimes the kid that's giving you the most trouble is the most anointed. Sometimes the kid that's in and out of drug abuse and in and out of prison, sometimes that kid who's completely disqualified is the person that God wants to anoint. I'd propose that God wants to anoint all of us. But my point is that sometimes we're looking after people who look qualified. They look like they could be a leader. And God sees other things in people that we don't see. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, why don't you turn there? We're going to read a few verses. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. You know when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts. Everybody say variety of gifts but the same spirit. There are a variety of ministries. Everybody say a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of effects. Everybody say a variety of effects, but the same God works all things in all persons. To each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all things, distributing each one just as he wills. I, I, I want to point out uh, a few things here. First of all, I want to back up for just a second and tell you a little bit about the historic context of these, of these verses. Because Paul is not actually, like his primary purpose here is not to teach about gifts of the Spirit. He lists nine gifts of the Spirit. Some people would think there's only nine gifts. I wouldn't argue with that. I think there's hundreds of gifts of the Spirit. I think there are, I I noticed in the Old Testament, the first person ever filled with the Spirit actually had gifts to carve in silver and gold and do artistry. I propose there are more gifts in the New Testament than there were in the Old. But Paul, I think Paul's making this point. He's speaking to people who were formerly Greek mythologists. They were, they were polytheists. They believed in multiple gods. And they've come in to the kingdom, and they're excited about moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But because they're polytheists, because they're, they're, their world uh, paradigm, their world view is that there are multiple gods, they see the gift of wisdom as one god. And the gift of prophecy as another God. And the, gift of, and the gift of discerning of spirits as another God. The gift of faith as another God. And Paul literally has to teach them how the spirit world works. So the first verse says, now concerning the spiritual gifts. But the word gifts isn't actually in the original Greek text. It actually reads like this. Now concerning the spiritual brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. And he tells them, you know when you were pagans, you were led astray by various idols... And then he goes on to say, Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You're like, what does that mean? Well, you remember, they're coming out of Greek mythology, and their gods fought one another. (laughs) And he's saying, listen, there are multiple different gifts. There are multiple different effects. There are multiple multiple different ministries, but there's only one Holy Spirit. (laughs) So the Holy Spirit that's giving that person a word of wisdom and giving this person a word of faith and giving that person a word of prophecy, that's all the same Spirit working simultaneously through different people. In other words, they looked at they, their worldview was that, that spirits, that God was finite. He can only be in one place at one time. That's how, that's their Greek, that's the Greek mythology. It's like, he can't be doing something in you while he's doing something in me. And Paul is teaching them, no, no, our God is one. <laughs> But he's in multiple people doing multiple things. He's a multitasker. And he can be in in India calling someone to repentance while he's in Reading healing the sick, while he's restoring somebody's uh, family over here. And God God is not limited to time and space. God is actually everywhere at once. And he's teaching the, 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 the Greek, new Greek believers, how the spirit world actually works. Are you with me? 
But the part I want to pick up is this. He says, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, variety of ministries, but the same uh, Lord, and there are a variety of effects, but the same God. I, I'd like to just take you through the fact that discerning of spirits, one gift, it has different ministries and has different effects. Are you following me? I'm saying the gift of discerning of spirits actually has, you can have the gift of discerning of spirits, and maybe you're using the gift of discerning of spirits to actually discern uh, 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 evil spirits to actually do, you know, to exercise spirits out of people. But someone else is using gifts of the spirit to actually help place people knowing the favor and the motivation behind someone. Someone else is using the gift of the spirit to see the favor that's on somebody. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Are you with me? So I'm saying the same gift can have multi-ministries and multi-effects. And sometimes we get a gift of discernment as an example, and we only know one, one dimension of that gift. And one of the things I want to do tonight is say to you, God wants to expand your ministry. He wants you to realize that this gift you have, it has more than one dimension. There are multi-dimensions to the same gift. Are you following me? So Paul, in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 16, I want to talk a little bit about deliverance ministry. In Acts chapter 16, it says this, it happened that as we were going to a place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination, everybody say a spirit of divination, divination. was following us and bringing, much, uh, and bringing much increased profit to her masters by foretelling. Verse 17, Falling after Paul, she, she kept crying out, these men are bond servants of the most high God. They are proclaiming the way of salvation. And she continued to do this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it came out of her at that moment. I, I wanna point out a few things. First of all, the, that girl, what she was saying, these men are great men of God. They're proclaiming to you the way of salvation. How many know that she was telling the truth? I, I'm pointing out that people say the devil always lies, and I'd propose the devil doesn't always lie. The devil is insane, but he's not stupid. And here this woman is saying the right thing, but the wrong spirit is actually motivating that thing. Have you ever been in a relationship with someone who maybe they use flattery with you? They're always like, you're amazing, you're the best, you're this, but something in you it's like, I call it Holy Ghost peepers. You're whole, like, you, you're like, what they're saying is true. What they're saying is supposed to be encouraging, but it feels like it's the wrong spirit. I'd like to point out, in my, in my opinion, this spirit of divination was actually a spirit of flattery. How many of you know when people flatter you, it's not for your sake, it's for theirs? I know people, every time they see you, like, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're this, you're that, but they actually don't like me. I'm like, you're trying to get an advantage. You're using flattery to actually seduce me so I'll do what you want it to be done. It's common in sales, right? I, I'm, by the way, I, there's lots of great salesmen, there's lots of great car salesmen, so let's be careful. But it's common, it's like stereotype Car salesman, oh, you're amazing, love your shoes. You know, wow, that's, where'd you get that hat? Not yours, I, I don't like those shoes, actually. <laughs> <They're>... <laughs> Good, brother. That's, that's the way to repent, right there. As soon as it falls out, let's get rid of them. I, I, I'm pointing out that we often enter in to, uh, we, in, in our culture, manipulation is common. People will say kind things to you because not for your sake, but for their sake. How many understand that's a seducing spirit? I'm not saying it's always an evil spirit. Sometimes it's just a bad human spirit. But my point is, whenever I agree with the enemy, I open the door for him and to use me. And when I'm saying good things to you for my sake, how many understand that's not the spirit of the Lord? And this woman's like, these men are great men of God. They're, they're preaching the way of salvation. She's saying exactly right. She seems to be a herald for them. But the truth is, there's actually a spirit divination behind her. And I'm pointing out that sometimes you don't think you need 
a spirit of discernment? Because you're like, oh, these people all love me. And I'm like, do they? Or is there something else going on? Are you with me? I, um, I remember I was talking about discerning of spirits that's used to see demonic spirits displayed. So I, what I'm doing right now is I'm saying same spirit can be, same spiritual gift can be used with many dimensions. Or you understand where I'm talking about? I remember, I've told the story many times, but we, uh, we get, we, on Sunday mornings, we preach four times, and we used to go from here to uh, Simpson University where we preached the second time. So you preach here once, then you go to Simpson, preach there a second time, the second service, then you come back for first service, and we used to do that. And, um, and we used to have uh, one of our staff pick us up and drive us there. And so I'd preach first service, and I get out to the car that's driving me, and it's one of our one of our staff that I've actually known for like 12 years, really stable guy, super nice guy. And we, and we actually instructed the drivers to please don't talk to us, just greet us, but don't talk to us because you have seven minutes to the next preach. And honestly, you kind of have to recollect your thoughts. And, and, and sometimes it's harder to preach over and over again. So you have to kind of collect your thoughts. So we, we actually asked the drivers, can you please not carry on a conversation so that the speakers can have seven minutes to kind of reset and do it again. And so I get in the car and I greet my friend. He's actually a friend of mine. He's, he's leading one of our ministries. And, um, and uh, he, you know, he says hi to me. And when I sit down in the seat, this overwhelming sense that I want to kill myself comes over me. Like really, really deep. And I, I'm like, okay, well, my message wasn't that bad. <laughs> I had those before. Like, Lord, take me home. Like Elijah. <laughs> I'm the only one left. Get me out of here. And so we started to roll out the driveway, and I'm like, I'm overtaken with this feeling that I want to kill myself. Like, not just a thought, like almost like an unction. And I'm aware that when a thought with an unction, with, when a thought that has an unction comes to my, my, my mind, that that's often a spirit. And so I look over at him, and I said, how are you doing? And he said, why are you asking? <laughs> like, that's a normal greeting. How are you doing? I'm doing great. But instead of saying, great, he said, why are you asking? And I'm like, okay, we only have a few minutes. I don't know how this is going to go. I said, uh, and, and so he said, why are you asking? I said, well, I just had this thing happen. And when I look over at him to get his answer, I see him hanging from a rope from a chimney. And he starts to tear up. And I said, he said, so why, why are you asking? I said, well, I got in the car. I have this overwhelming feeling. I want to kill myself. And I looked over at you. And I, I had this, this, this vision in my mind. It was an open vision in my mind. They were hanging from a rope from a chimney. And he bursts out in tears. And he starts bawling. Now, we're just now rolling out of the driveway. And I'm like, okay, whoa, how's this going to go? And he said, for six months, Every waking minute, I have this overwhelming sense that I'm supposed to kill myself. Last night, I got up on my roof and tied a rope around the chimney and tied it around my neck. And he said, I got to the edge of the roof, and right before I jumped, he said, this voice in my mind said, don't jump, tomorrow I'm going to deliver you. He said to me. Now, he isn't crying, he is wailing. And he's supposed to drive me. And so I'm like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do we do? What do we do? I, they're expecting me to preach. Can't really stop and do a deliverance here. And I, I look over and again, and I see in my mind, this is all happening in my mind, not open vision. I see myself slapping him in the chest really hard and saying, you spirit of suicide, leave. So I'm like, oh, this is not going to be good. So I'm like, well, it's all I got. So I say to my friend, hey, I, I told him, well, I see myself slapping you in your chest and telling the spirit of suicide to, to go. Now he's still wailing, like on, <gasps> he can't catch his breath. And he says, <gasps> just <laughs> hit me as hard as you want. <laughs> I said, okay, hang on to the steering wheel. So he's hanging on the steering wheel, and now we're down towards the bottom of, the, of, of our road, kind of rolling slow. 
And I slap him really hard on the chest and say, you know, which I've never done a deliverance that way before or since. Like, I have no idea why that has anything to do with deliverance. And I said, in Jesus' name, you spirit of suicide, leave. And he went, ah! like that. And I was just driving. He's, the wailing stopped, but he's just weeping uncontrollably. And we drive all the way to Simpson. I don't say anything. I'm like, you know, I'm like, hope this took. <laughs> and so we stop. I get out, and I think, well, I should at least ask him how it's going. Because <laughs> I got to preach for 45 minutes. So I put my head back in the car, and I go, dude, how you doing? He goes, man, it's gone. I said, <laughs> how do you know it's gone? He said, oh, man. You don't understand. It plagues me every waking moment. I'm like, okay. So I go in and I preach better. I preach really good, second service. <laughs> Come back out. And, um, and then Tuesday, which is our Monday, our first day back to work. Tuesday, I get to work. He's standing in my doorway. And he's just covered wet. And he says to me, dude, I've been waiting for you. I'm like, are you okay? He's, man, I'm great. I'm great. I owe my life to you. My like, oh no, you don't owe your life to me. You owe your life to Jesus. It's like, all I did was slap you and said something. He's the one that got you delivered. But I do fix stuff. I feel the talk for a couple more minutes. I, I have, want to go on to the next point, but I, I, I want to uh, say that there are a lot of believers that actually have the gift of distinguishing of spirits but don't know it. And I have had many experiences. This is early days when I first came to Bethel. Dan Fairley and I and uh, a guy named Ellen Ray were our main counselors. And, uh, and a lot of people were, end up in my office diagnosed as bipolar. And some of them probably were bipolar. But what I noticed is that people who have a strong gift of distinguishing of spirits but don't know how to use it actually have ups and downs that they can't explain, and they often are medicated for something that actually, actually isn't a first heaven problem. It's not a physical problem. It's actually a spiritual issue in that they don't know how to use the gift they have. So let me explain to you partly how discerning of spirits works with the effect of, in the, in the area of affecting deliverances. Are you with me? Because I want to take you out of, uh, discerning of spirits is just for casting out demons. Okay, I'm going to show you that that's not just for that, but I want to show you that when it is, this is how it most often manifests. Can you say most often? Most often. That means not always, but most often. Are you with me? If you are, uh, if you get in someone's metron, and by the way, the word metron means sphere of influence. Everybody has a sphere of influence. Are you with me? When you get in someone's sphere of influence, if they have a demon, like, I'm not talking about they're in a bad mood. I'm not talking about they have a mental, uh, mentally ill, because a lot of people are mentally ill, don't have demons. Not everybody who has mentally ill has demons. Are you with me? Yeah. But if you get into someone's space that is actually being affected by a demon, and you have the gift of discerning of spirits, whatever's bothering them will bother you. For example, if somebody has a spirit of pornography, I'm not talking about they have a problem with pornography that's human, I'm talking about that it has a demonic spirit attached to it. When you get in your space, in their space, you will most likely start seeing porno pornographic pictures. If you don't know that's them, you think there's something wrong with you. If you have a very strong gift of discerning of spirits and it's being used in the deliverance side, you can go from city to city and your moods will shift according to what spirit is over that region. If you don't know that's a spirit, you can feel like you're going from mood to mood. Here's a super common, and I bet you many people will, will have had this experience, ladies especially. Have you ever gone to the store, like you're, you're gonna get, someone's gonna watch the kids, you're gonna go shopping, you're excited about it, it's like, ha, I get a break, I get to go shopping, you're full of energy, you walk into the store and instantly you're exhausted. Like, you actually are so tired, you feel like, I'm just going to grab the thing I came for and get out of here. And you get in the car, and you drive a mile, and you're fine again. And you go, I got my second win. 
You didn't get your second win. What happened was you came into that store and either the manager or the owner, someone who has authority in that store. In other words, their metrons, the size of that store, has a spirit of fainting. Isaiah 61, I'm gonna give you a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. When you came into their metron, you came under their spirit because you didn't know that that was a spirit. And you felt what they were feeling, but you didn't know what to do about it because you didn't know it wasn't you. And when you got out of their metron, ha, you could breathe again. Are you with me? And what I'm getting at is if you don't know how to use, if you don't know, if you don't know how to work with the Holy Spirit with that, with that gift, and, you, and on the side of discerning evil spirits, are you with me? You can just feel like you're having mood shifts and you're having these things happen. It's like, I'm under attack all the time. It's like, well, you might be, but I'd like to propose that the Lord wants to use you to get other people delivered. So what I would used to do in counseling, this is after about a year of being here, uh, if someone would come into my office, I would tell my secretary, I don't wanna know why they're in here because I don't want to have myself triggered while they have a problem with porn or they have a problem with marriage or whatever. And she's like, okay. So they would come in my office and have them sit down and I say, hey, before we talk about your issue, let's pray. And I grab their hands. I like to grab their hands because now I know I'm in their metron. You can't get much further, much closer than I'm touching you. And I put on my recorded prayer. Lord, give us wisdom today. Lord, I I just pray for a breakthrough. You know, something I don't have to think about, but I'm praying. But what I'm really doing is waiting to see if if there's anything on them that bothers me. If I touch them, let's say a guy comes in and I touch him, we're praying, and nothing happens. And I'm like, okay, Herbie, what's going on? Oh, man, I got this problem with porn. Okay, when I got into Henry's, Herbie's Metron, I did not have porn issues. I'm like, Herbie needs to learn how to control and manage and, dis- and discipline himself to get away from the computer and stop behaving like an unbeliever. He needs some practical guides from a father or a big brother and some accountability. But if I touch Herbie and I start having pornographic thoughts, I'm like, Herbie isn't gonna get, Herbie's not gonna leave this office well by giving him a list of disciplines and accountability. Herbie needs delivered. Now, to stay free, Donna's deliverance queen on the front row, to stay free, Herbie needs some accountability. Herbie needs some great discipline. Herbie needs some great tools. Yes, he does. He needs to close those doors. But Herbie's not going to leave my office well without getting free. Are you with me? And I'm saying, if we don't... Okay, back to it. The opening statement. We live in a three-dimensional world, right? We live first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. We'll talk about it in just a minute. But if you have a second heaven problem, you're not going to solve that with a first heaven solution. I'm saying if, if Herbie just needs discipline and accountability, he's got a first heaven problem and you can solve it with a first heaven solution. But if Herbie has a demonic issue, you're not gonna solve that with a first heaven solution. Are you with me? So discernment, listen, when you actually learn how to use the gift of discernment, you're gonna be so much more successful in life because I wanna point out that at least a third of the time, the problem you think you have isn't the problem you actually have. Let me say that again. Tonight can make you way more successful in life because oftentimes the problem you think you have isn't the problem you really have. Are you with me? And we are medicating people and we are counseling people. Listen, I'm not against medication. I had a nervous breakdown. I took medication for a year. Uh, So don't misunderstand me. But we are medicating people. We are numbing often the pain of demonic activity in their life and listen you can numb it but you can't get rid of it you can you can't medicate a demon out of someone and i don't think everybody has a demon i used to think that but i know i do no i'm <laughs> am, am i am i making sense so far okay 
So now let's turn to Luke chapter 14, verse seven. Now I wanna teach you how to give, use the gift of distinguishing of spirits for another purpose. Jesus began speaking to the, uh, uh, in a, I'm sorry, Je Jesus began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table saying, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. Okay, listen to this. For someone more what? Distinguished, distinguished than you might be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you'll proceed to occupy the last place. And he goes on to tell him to take the lower place and get invited up. I, I want to point out that God loves us all the same, but he favors us differently. Listen, this is really profoundly powerful if you actually want to grow in God. Because God loves us all the same, but he favors us differently. And before you get mad, you have the opportunity to gain favor that you may not have. But Jesus, in Luke 2, 52, it says, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature, and in favor, he was increasing with favor, in favor with God and man. So we, we can say, well, yeah, of course Jesus is increasing in favor with man. He's doing miracles. He's doing signs and wonders. People are like, whoa, wow, he's amazing. But the stunning part is it says that Jesus, who was born the son of God, increased in favor with God, not just man. Are you with me? Okay, now Jesus, people hate this teaching online. Whenever, every time I share anything about this, people are like, we're all equal. I'm like, we are all equally loved, but we're not equally favored. How? Okay, so let me just say, there, there are three levels of life. Curses, right? Sowing and reaping, right? And blessing. Curses. Before you knew God, what's a curse mean? You can do the right thing, but the wrong thing still happens. You're going to till the ground, you're going to do the right thing, but it's going to yield thorns and thistles. You did the right thing, but the wrong thing still happened. Are you with me? But the next level of life is sowing and reaping. What's that mean? It means what a man sows, so shall he reap. So it means you do the right thing, and you reap the right thing. That's pretty good, right? Yes, Chris, that's very good. Thank you. Why are you guys doing this? I don't know what this means. But Matthew 6, Jesus said, the birds of the air, they don't sow, nor do they reap, but God takes care of them. The highest level of life isn't sowing or reaping. The highest level of life is inheritance. That means you get what someone else worked for. Are you with me? So, <laughs> okay. See if I can get this. In, in Hebrews chapter 6, it lists six elementary teachings of Christ resurrection from the dead, baptism, laying on of hands. It calls the laying on of hands one of the elementary teachings of Christ. Now, remember, this is the book of Hebrews, it's written to the Hebrews. He's not talking in this context of laying on of hands for healing. He's talking about the laying on of hands to transfer inheritance. Do you remember how Jacob deceived his brother? Well, he deceived his father out of the inheritance. And when his father laid hands on Jacob, when Isaac laid hands on Jacob and imparted the blessing to him because he thought because he thought it was Esau. And then a, a couple hours later, Esau comes in and says, Father, here's your, your meal. Give me the blessing. And Isaac said, Esau? Who was that guy? And he said, oh my gosh, Isaac has stolen my inheritance. And then Esau said, bless me too. And Isaac said, I already gave it away. It wasn't a bless me line. It was a release and inheritance line. Are you with me? 
What I'm getting at is that the way you receive an inheritance from other people, the way you receive a blessing, you remember, if you, if you honor your mother and father, you'll what? You receive life. How many know that honor, life, flows through honor? When you honor somebody that has something greater than you, you create a place for blessing to follow you. If you take a seat that's too high, the worst thing that happens isn't that you get invited down, it's that the, it's that the, the anointing that's on someone else's life doesn't flow to you because you didn't honor what was in them. How do I know if somebody has more favor, is more distinguished in God? The gift of distinguishing of spirits. <laughs> Have you ever come into someone's presence and you sense the anointing of God on them? I remember, <laughs> I don't know if I've told the story publicly, so Bill may have not heard it. I remember that um, Rick Joyner was, uh, had lunch with us when he spoke here many years ago at Bill's house. And, um, and he was talking about apostolic government, which I was studying and writing a book on. So I couldn't wait for him to pause because I'm like, I'm going to give him some revelation. <laughs> give, him some, like, give him the first seven chapters of the book of Revelation right here. And, uh, and I was really excited about that subject. And so he was talking about apostles and prophets and how they relate. And I was just like, ah, oh, so excited. And when he paused, I was going to like tell him my revelation. And immediately in my head, right before I open my mouth, which doesn't happen very often, usually I open my mouth and then I <laughs> say sorry. Before I open my mouth, the Lord said, he's, you're the student, he's the teacher. Be quiet and listen. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Now he missed out on my revelation. What I'm getting at is, how do you know when you're in the presence of someone? It's a little bit metaphoric now. This part is metaphoric. Who could lay hands on you and give you something you don't have? You have to be able to discern that they have something you don't have. Sometimes we are in disagreement with someone's theology, and we miss the opportunity to discern with God's what, because we think that the anointing flows on people because they're right. And we miss, we miss the insight that you don't have to be right to be anointed. <laughs> okay. Good point, Chris. Okay. Now, turn to Mark chapter 13. You, I, I'm just going to read it. It's only one verse. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now, the way many Christians read this, and leaders, they read it like this. For false Christs, and all the all prophets in the last days will be false. You know, if Jesus was saying that all the prophets in the in the in the last days will be false, could have saved us a lot of problems. Say, now, listen. There's going to be false Christ, and by the way, all the prophets in the last days will be false. The only reason there's false prophets is because there's real ones. Are you with me? And the challenge is, he goes on to say that if possible, even the elect would be deceived. How do you make sure you're not deceived? Remember, we just read a story in Acts 16 about a woman who was telling the truth, but it was the wrong spirit. Like, I hear a lot of people say, well, you can discern a false prophet because they get the prophetic word wrong. I point out that Agabus got the prophetic word wrong in the book of Acts, and he was a true prophet. And the spirit of divination on the other girl, she got the word right, and she was a false prophet. So I'm saying, if you're just 
saying, well, if the word, if they get the word right, they're a true prophet, I'm like, well, then this lady is a true prophet because she got the word right. But actually, she was a false prophet because her prophetic gift was coming from the spirit of divination. Are you following me? So I'm pointing out, in fact, let's just take it a step further. Let's move away from uh, false prophets for just a minute and discerning false prophets and, and talk about judging prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. I'd like to point out that prophecy is always about the future. Prophecy is foretelling, I'm telling you the future, and foretelling, I'm causing the future. Are you following me? For example, in 1 Kings chapter 13, an unnamed prophet prophesies that a man named Josiah will become king. And in 2 Kings oh, 22, it says, and in this certain year, Josiah becomes king at eight years old. You know how long between 1 Kings 13 and 2 Kings 22? 370 years. I'd proposed that you may not think that was a good prophecy if you lived in the first Kings 13 time because that king, that guy prophesied something that didn't happen for 370 years. So if you're judging prophecy by the outcome, how are you judging prophecy immediately as it's pointed out in 1 Corinthians 14, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. How am I passing judgment if prophecy is always about the future? The way I'm passing judgment is through the gift of distinguishing of spirits. When I'm judging prophecy, what I'm actually doing is discerning, was that the human spirit? Obviously, was that an evil spirit? Or was that the Holy Spirit? Because if it's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot lie. Are you with me? I'm not judging the outcome because I don't know the outcome. I'm judging the source. I can't even judge prophecy if I don't have the gift of distinguishing of spirits. Because what I'm judging is what spirit is giving the word. I'm not judging, it. is that a good word or a bad word? Well, obviously if someone says, you're gonna die tomorrow, I'm like, oh, that's a bad word. But how many of you know, a lot of people, a lot of people give bad words that, it's not necessarily the devil because someone made a human mistake. You ever made a mistake the devil wasn't involved in? Yeah. I, I would love to blame the devil for all the mistakes Kathy's made. See that? <laughs> I love that couch. I'll be sleeping on it again tonight. In all seriousness, I would love to blame all my mistakes on the devil. But very few of them he's involved in. Very few of them. But my point is, is that this gift of distinguishing the spirits, it's one gift, but it has multiple different uses. Are you with me? And you can learn how to use the gift of discerning of spirits so that you can navigate the spirit world really powerfully. I... I um, Here's a, here's a big challenge. Um, let's see, how am I gonna do this? Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit in my notes, and I'm gonna tell you a story. In Genesis chapter 15, God has an encounter with Abram, who will be Abraham. I don't know if you know the story, so I'll just pretend that you don't know it at all. And God says to him, you're gonna have I'm gonna bless you. Your kid's gonna be like, you've heard this, right? Stars of the sky, sands of the sea. It's gonna be amazing. And you are gonna be a father to many nations. But then in the midst of this wonderful prophecy, he says to him, except for there's gonna be a little glitch in this beautiful prophetic word. And it's gonna last just for 400 years. And for 400 years, your sons and daughters are going to be under the control of the Egyptians. And they're gonna be oppressed for 400 years. They're gonna be oppressed until verse 16 of chapter 15. They're gonna be oppressed 
until the iniquity of the Amorites is complete. And when the iniquity, iniquity of the Amorites is complete, I'm going to let my people go. Now, I'll bet you know this story, right? You've read the Bible or you've seen the movie. <laughs> right? You know the story. And what happens is, is that in the 320th year, they've been in bondage for 320 years, the Pharaoh decides to kill all the firstborn male Jewish children. You know the story? And Moses is born, and his mother takes Moses, instead of killing him, puts him in a basket and sends him down the river. And what happens? The princess, Pharaoh's daughter, is bathing in the river. And the basket of Moses, with Moses in it, ends up in her presence. And she takes that basket, takes Moses out, and says, can we find someone to nurse this baby? And she goes to her mother, who she doesn't know that it's Moses' mother, and she said, can I pay you to feed your baby? <laughs> doesn't know it's hers, his baby. Can I, feed, can I pay you to feed this baby? Not only does Moses get rescued, but Moses' mother finally gets paid for her work. And she feeds that child. <laughs> God's got a plan. Devil's got a plan. God's got a plan too. She feeds that, plan, that, that child. And Moses grows in the presence of Pharaoh. Wow. And he learns. Get this. Follow me. Before you knew God, God already knew you. Yeah. Moses hasn't met God yet. But God already knows him. And guess what Moses is going to be ultimately? The leader of a nation. So what's Moses need if he's a slave? He needs to learn how to lead a nation. So what's God do? He puts him in Pharaoh's house. Wow. What for? So he can learn how to lead a nation. Because he's a slave. He don't know nothing about leadership. I'm not saying Pharaoh was a godly leader. I'm saying there's some things you can learn from the world, right? Yes. Like how to lead a nation. Pharaoh, Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house. And when he's 40 years old... He sees his brothers being mistreated by the Egyptian and something, listen to this, inherently, inherent is in him. He doesn't even know why. But he suddenly realizes that he needs to defend his brothers. Why? Because how many of you know that you can always tell how close you are to the palace by how you deal with injustice? If you're the Pharaoh, everything's your problem. So when Moses sees injustice, he clicks into Pharaoh mode, and he's like, this is my job. I've got to stop. I'm the son of, I'm, he's not thinking I'm the son of God. He's thinking I'm the son of Pharaoh. And he kills the Egyptian. Remember this? And the next day, he tries to break up his brothers from arguing, and they go, who are you? And what happens to Moses? He runs out into the wilderness. And how long is he out there? 40 years. Moses is the right guy with the right anointing. But he's 40 years too early. Why? Because God said, in the 400th year, I'm going to let you go. He's born in the 320th year. He tries to free them in the 360 year. Did I say it right? 360 years. In the 400th year, he's in the wilderness. And he runs into a bush that talks. Not George. <laughs> and God says, I've heard the oppression of my people, and I send you. Are you with me? I heard the oppression of my people, and I send you. Okay, now, before we go on, I want to just give you a quick explanation of three heavens just in case you don't know what that is. Okay, so Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that's, I used to say it's the visible world, but how many know there's a lot of things invisible, like electricity, in this first heaven? So it's the human world, okay? In Ephesians chapter 6, 
It says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness in heavenly places. How many know there are no demons in God's heaven? We call this second heaven. This is the demonic realm. And then Paul said in uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, I know a man who went to the third heaven. How many know if there's a third heaven, there has to be a second and a first? So how many understand that this is the God realm? And by the way, you live in two heavens. You live in the Genesis 1 heaven, and you've been raised up and seated in heavenly places with Christ. So you live in first heaven and third heaven. Are you with me? Okay, so I'm talking about discerning of spirits. Are you with me? Okay, so now we're going to talk about heavens. We're going to talk about what heaven is involved in this incident. Because principalities and powers in the second heaven are controlling things that happen in the first heaven according to Ephesians chapter 2. Are you with me? Which says that we were once under the control of the prince of the power of the air that's still working in the sons of disobedience. So there's the prince of the power of the air that is still at work in the sons of disobedience. That's the second heaven. Are you with me? But we sit in the third heaven and the first heaven. Is this too complicated? What I'm getting at is if you have a first heaven problem, you can sit in your first heaven seat and solve it, hopefully. But if you have a second heaven problem, you must come up here. Are you with me? Okay, now, I want to ask you a question. You know, understand the heavens? Okay, so, God prophesied, are you bored? God prophesied to Abraham that he's going to be blessed. His kids, stars of the sky, sands of the sea. It's going to be amazing. You're going to be father of many nations, except for this 400 years. Are you with me? Okay, so God says, in, in the 400th year, the iniquity of the Amorites is going to be complete. I'm going to let them go. Are you with me? Okay, so in the 320th year, the Pharaoh gets this idea to kill all the first male, firstborn male Jewish children. Here's my point. Now God is going to send Moses to Pharaoh. It's the 400th year. Are you following me? And God says to Pharaoh, Moses says to God, Hey God, what's going to happen when I go? Let my people go. And he goes, screw you. <laughs> then what do I do? And God says, throw down your staff. Remember this? Turns into a snake. First he says, put your hand in here. Pick it out. It's got leprosy. Put it back in. It's healed. And God goes, throw down your staff. Staff turns into a snake. God goes, try those two. Try those two. When you get to Pharaoh, try those two. And we'll work from there. So God, so Moses goes to Pharaoh. Says, let my people go. You know the story. And Pharaoh goes, that ain't gonna happen, bro. I'm not letting the people go. And Moses says to Aaron, throw down your staff. By the way, you wanna talk about impartation? It's not Moses' staff that turns into a snake. It's Aaron's staff. Moses has already imparted the gift that God gave him to his older brother, Aaron. Aaron throws down his staff, and it becomes a snake. And Pharaoh turns to his sorcerers and goes, can you do this? And they throw down their staff, and what happens? It becomes two snakes. And all of a sudden, we got two snakes. And it says that Aaron's snake ate the sorcerer's snake. Okay, where am I going? First of all, who initiated this fight? Won the devil. See, the devil is reacting to God's prophetic word in the 400th year. I'm going to let the people go. So what does the devil know? There's a deliverer. What's he trying to do? Find and kill the deliverer. The enemy is not, he's not on the offense. He's on the defense. He's trying to stop the word to Abraham. That in the 400th year, and he knows, he's figured out the calendar. Listen, the, the deliverer has to be alive. Let's kill the deliverer. He's trying to win before it ever gets to Pharaoh. So he kills the firstborn male children. My point is, the devil is, God's not, the devil isn't after you. 
The devil is trying to stop what God's doing in you. Sometimes you can tell the call of God in your life by where the devil attacks you. Are you following me? So I'm pointing out that this, isn't a, 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 this battle did not start with the second heaven. This battle started with the third heaven, and God goes, all right, let's birth Moses. And the devil goes, there's a deliverer. Demons, go kill him. Go tell Pharaoh, listen, get in his mind. Tell him, destroy all the firstborn male Jewish children. And the devil is reacting. He's trying... I'm trying to say that sometimes what we see as, well, we need a revival because da-da, and the enemy is often reacting to what he knows God's about to do, and he's trying to stop it before it gains momentum. Are you with me? It reminds me of the story of Gideon, where God says to Gideon, okay, Gideon, here's what you're going to do. Here's the battle plan, and he whittles them down to 300 people, and then he says, like, okay, here's the battle plan. Ready, Gideon? Gideon, close here. Okay, Gideon, what you're going to do is you're going to get some jars, you got to get some candles, and you get some trumpets. <laughs> you notice something missing? Like spears and bows. And God goes, okay, what you're going to do, you're going to wait till evening, you're going to get up on the top of the mountain, and you're going to blow the trumpet, light the candles, and break the jars. Hey. Gideon's like, you can imagine you're going to tell the guys, okay, guys, huddle up. <laughs> Talking to God, here's what he said. So we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to get some jars. We're going to get some trumpets. We're going to get some candles. Okay, Henry, get the candles. Joel, get the jars. Moses, get some trumpets. What we're going to do is we're going to light the candles. We're going to blow the trumpets. We're going to break the jars. <laughs> this guy's got to be like, Gideon, you're freaking crazy. He's terrified. So that morning, he wakes up, and his mighty man of valor is terrified. And God goes, okay, if you're getting you scared, oh, no, I'm terrified. God goes, I want you to go down to the enemy's camp. Sneak down in there and see what they're saying about you. He gets down to the enemy's camp, and he hears. He's hiding in the bushes, and he hears one Mennonite, 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 not the Mennonites. <laughs> Those are the good guys. Mennonites, the enemy soldier telling the other enemy soldier, I had a dream last night. What was it? I had a dream that this wasn't a tumbleweed. It was a... No, it wasn't. Whatever it was. Barley loaf. It was rolling over the top of our tents and destroying them. And the other guy goes, oh, that's none other than Gideon. God's anointed him to kill us all. That Gideon hears from the enemy. And I'm pointing out the enemy often knows your destiny better than you do. Okay, we've got to finish the story. So Moses goes before Pharaoh, throws down staff. Aaron does. It's a snake. Aaron, I mean, uh, Mo, Pharaoh's uh, sorcerers throw down their staffs. It becomes two snakes, and there's a snake war. Here's the challenge why you need discerning of spirits. Because here's what the church does. The church, the 21st century church goes, oh, snakes, sorcerers. Don't use snakes. Listen, anybody who, anybody who does snakes, oh, that's what the New Age movement does. That's what the demonic world does. And we back off of anything we see in the demonic world, not realizing that the devil only counterfeits what God does, and he only counterfeits what God does powerfully. Did you hear what I just said? I'm saying that the enemy only counterfeits powerful things. So we go, well, I see that in the enemy camp, and I see that in the New Age camp, and I see that over here in the occult camp, and I see that over there, and pretty soon we're like, we can't do that, and we can't do that, and that, that thing over there that Bethel does, oh, the devil does that too. And pretty soon you're over here with the powerless gospel that all you have is words and no power because you ran away from all the snakes. Are you with me? Yes. And I'm saying, you don't run away from the snakes. You get discernment so you know what snake is the Lord's and what snake is the devil's. Because they look alike. 
Did you get what I just said? Yeah. I'm saying if you don't have discernment, you're, listen, if you don't have the gift of discernment, the best thing you can do is run away from all snakes because at least you don't get bit. <laughs> but if you have the gift of discerning the spirit, you're like, no, wait a second. I see there's 10 snakes there. That's a God snake right there. And that God snake initiated the battle. Did you get that? The, the devil was reacting to what Moses did. Moses wasn't reacting to what the devil did. But if you come late to the party, all you see is snakes. Did you get what I just said? I'm saying if you come late to the party, all you see is snakes. You, you, if you come late to the party, I'm just being like, it's, a, it's an analogy, it's, it, it's, it's a metaphor, but I'm saying if you come late, you just see snakes. You didn't see that Moses threw down his staff first and it became a snake and he initiated it. You just come and all you see is snakes. If you come to the revival late, you're just like, it's snakes. <laughs> These people are crazy. Because you weren't there for the initiation of the snake match. And you don't realize that if you get out of the snake battle, you ain't going to go free. If you run away from this battle, because guess what's going to happen? There's going to be 10 plagues. And for the first time, Four, I believe, plagues. Every time God does something, the enemy duplicates it. In my mind, it's a little bit like Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> the Lord calls, <laughs> the Lord calls for gnats, and the and the sorcerer's are like, we can do that. <laughs> it's like a little like a Myrtle and what's his name, you know? It's just, <laughs> it's just like. It's, a, it's, a, it's just like Myrtle and, and, and Harry, like, can you do that? Oh, I can do that. And they increase the plagues. I bet you Pharaoh's like, thank you guys. That was very helpful. <laughs> we can turn the blood to water. We can do that too. <laughs> I think pretty soon, like, Pharaoh's like, okay, guys, y y your consulting is over. But my point is, for the first several moves of God in Egypt that's there specifically to set the people free, the enemy duplicates every single one of them. Are you with me? In fact, finally, the sorcerers say to Pharaoh, this must be God, we can't do this. But the first few, few things they did that were supernatural, I'm saying this, the enemy has power. You have all power. People say the devil's not powerful. He is, God said, I'm gonna give you power over all the power of the evil one. Like if you back away, uh, let's say there was, ten, I know there was 10 plagues. It, it, I don't know how many the enemy did, five, someone can look it up. But let's say it's four. If you back off after three, you're not gonna get the people free. <laughs> and I'm not talking about plagues. I'm using it as an analogy. I'm saying we get out of the race because the enemy keeps duplicating what we're doing. Why is he doing that? To muddy the water so people won't know it's God. But the, the goal, the goal, uh, you're down here and it's the first plague. You're not gonna plague anyone. You understand what I'm going to? Please don't ask God for plague people. I'm using it as an analogy. You have the first plague, the enemy duplicates it. You have the second plague, the enemy duplicates it. You have the third plague. The enemy duplicates it. You have the fourth plague. The enemy duplicates it. You're like, oh, I got to stop doing this. And you leave the fight because the enemy is duplicating him and you're getting all the social pressure from social media and all these crazy people. Look at, he's doing the same thing the devil does. But the idea isn't to stop. The idea isn't to stop. The idea is to keep moving up. Keep moving up. I'm not retreating. I'm going to keep going deeper until the enemy goes, this has to be God. We can't do this. And what we often do is move away. The social media pressure, the pressure from people who have no discernment, they're like, there's a false prophet, a, a false Christ, a false apostles. And, and, you know, and by the way, the, Jesus said that there would be some. 
So, the, so there's enough truth there. There is false prophets. There is false apostles. There are false Christ. I mean, they are in the mix of what God is doing because the enemy's trying to get nobody to trust the prophets, no one to trust the apostles because you got these bozos doing false stuff. And people go, there it is. All the apostles are false. All the prophets are false. And look, there's false Christ. And I'm like, I'm pointing out the enemy wants to dilute the, the land so nobody trusts what God is doing. And listen, you may be an elect. You may be like, what's an elect? An elder in the church. A faithful servant of God. Somebody who knows the word inside out. And God goes, Jesus said, and even you could be dece deceived into thinking that guy's got the right snake. How do I make sure you're not? You have discernment. Something in here goes, something's wrong. Listen, I know she's got the right word. I, 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 I know, I know. And, and you know how a lots of prophetic, false prophetic ministry happens? I said it earlier, through flattery. People make their way in. Oh, you know, the pastor doesn't, just doesn't know how amazing you are. I know how amazing you are. I had a vision of you. And pretty soon they work against the leadership by complimenting people, telling them what they want to hear. And by the way, a lot of it's true. Like the spirit of divination on a lady. Often that, prof that, that false prophetic, false prophet, that false prophetic ministry is often saying things that are true, but it's a spirit of divination and manipulation trying to get them away and onto themselves instead of onto the leadership. But our people, the people of God will be wise and do great exploits. The people of God will go, that's the wrong spirit. Well, man, they said you had this prophetic ministry. They said that this is, and you remember that happening here? I know they said the right thing, but something's wrong. I don't trust that spirit on that person. And I'm not talking about suspicion. I'm talking about discernment. Because suspicion is the evil stepsister of discernment. That's a good word. Okay, why don't you stand? I'm going to pray for you. Do you know what I'm going to pray for you? This probably has a likely conclusion, this message. How do you get spiritual gifts? Paul said, I long to come to you, Romans 1. I long to come to you that I might impart a spiritual gift to you that you may be established. So I believe that we can give gifts that we receive freely from God. We can give them away freely. So I'd like to airdrop a gift to you. Okay, so you got to turn on. Turn on your airdrop thing right there. And you that, all, all of our family that's online, just, you know, get ready, get yourself and turn on your airdrop there on your Holy Spirit iPhone. And I'm going to pray. How many of you know, I, not, I have nothing to give you except for what the Lord's given me for free. I want to be clear. Like, I'm not giving you some human gift. I, I'm going to give you what God gave me. So are you ready? Now, what's going to happen is you're going to get this gift and you're going to manage this gift so you don't feel bipolar by morning. So that you're not at the psychiatrist by next Friday. Okay? So when you feel a little bit weird, you're like, oh, this is that thing. Okay, Lord, what am I discerning? How do I deal with it? Are you with me? Because you're not going to get another teaching from me on how to deal with it for a little while. So that could be a very expensive psychology bill. <laughs> That was a joke. Okay, so okay, so why don't you just put your hands out like as just a sign, I receive this. And Lord, I thank you. You said that you gave us to equip the saints to do the work of service. And Lord, I pray right now that you would relief, release the gift of discerning or distinguishing of spirits over every single person in this room and on our online campus in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you are the great teacher. You're the great leader. You're the great teacher. It's your gift. 
And Lord, I pray that you would leave them, that you would not leave them without great teaching, that you would teach them, that you would guide them, that you, Lord, that you would be their personal mentor in this area of this, using this gift for something powerfully and profoundly uh, spiritual that would move them forward in the body of Christ. And I bless them in Jesus' name. And I want you to say, I receive it for myself. Okay, now here's what I want you to do. You're going to receive this gift, and then tomorrow I want you to get your family together, and I want you to lay your hands on them, if they'll let you, and say, I got a gift, I'm going to give it to you. I remember when the vineyard, when our team went to see, uh, to see John Wimber at the vineyard, they came back that the next week, and everyone they laid hands on for the next several weeks fell down on the ground. Kathy and I didn't make that. We weren't able to go. And we just had the same ministry. We had those elders lay hands on Kathy and I. They prayed for us the very next week. We prayed for people, and they fell down. Listen, there's nothing spiritual about falling down. I'm just pointing out that whatever it is they received at the vineyard, they were able to impart to me, to Kathy and I, and we got to move in it. And I believe that God wants us to move in families. And so I just want to instruct you that you're going to take this, you're going to give it to your spouse, you're going to give it to your children, and, and, you know, if they don't want it, then that's fine, obviously. But I believe that you want your whole family to walk in it. And then you need to really study the gift of the distinguishing of spirits and begin to teach your family, hey, this is how it operates. So you don't end up with side effects that you don't want. So I bless you in Jesus' name. Before we go, is there anybody in here that doesn't know Jesus? Would you raise your hand? Maybe you've fallen away, you walked away, and you came here tonight, and you're like, oh, my heart is burning within me. Somebody right there. Awesome. We just bless you. Um, why don't you just come right here? Can someone just meet? Yeah. Angela, one of you guys. Awesome. I, I, I just want to uh, say something to you. Which one of you is receiving the Lord? Oh, you are. Um, the, the Lord's telling me that the things that have been broken and destroyed in your life, he's right now fixing. And he's healing relationships. He's healing hearts. He's restoring you completely. And this is a great season for you to be uh, completely restored and to be blessed. And uh, so I bless you in Jesus' name. And our friends are going to talk through um, leading you to the Lord right there. Thank you so much. Thanks for your courage. Let's just bless her in Jesus' name. Thank you.